So I'm really excited to share one of my biggest and I think coolest projects with you guys. And it is this, building my Mark II ski sled. Several years ago, I built a ski sled which was designed to go very quickly down no winter maintenance roads. And you can check out that video here. That sled worked pretty well, but the issue had to do with the steering. I couldn't go around some of the corners as quickly as I would have liked. And so I designed this prototype to basically correct those issues. Now I know this video isn't the typical EV content you would expect here, so hopefully you humor me on this for this video and the next video, and then we'll get back to our regularly scheduled EV content. So let's start with how I ended up designing this thing, and then we will move into the build later on. The design of this sled is partially taken from the classic flexible flyer sled that's popular in the US, or used to be popular. Those sleds have red steel runners, a wooden deck, and so you can kind of see where the inspiration comes from. They also have a handlebar out front like this that can be actuated when you're laying down, or if you're sitting up, you can push it with your feet. The sled is built around a central box frame made of aluminum. Through this aluminum box are four crossbars, two of which have these support towers which connect to the skis. There's two ski pivots on each ski, which allow the skis to pivot, like so. The pivoting action left and right is what steers the sled. There are integrated stops built into these support towers, which prevent the skis from flipping on their side. That's something that happened in the past, and I really wanted to avoid it here. To turn the sled, the handlebar is connected to a bar inside the central box tube. That bar acts on this cross link, which connects to two tie rods that connect to the front pivots. This system is really clean, but it's also pretty precise because everything is directly connected through to the pivot points. If you're wondering what this thing's for, that's just to mount the GoPro. The skis are configured in a negative camber configuration at all times. The reason for this is that in the past, I've tipped through the flat part of the ski, and when I come out of a corner, it would catch, and it would try to throw me off the sled. So as I said, this sled is designed to go down no winter maintenance roads at high speed, and I really wanted to perfect the steering here. The main way I accomplished this was by taking the frame connection points on the skis and moving them to the center of the ski. A ski is designed to be weighted in the middle when it goes into a carve, and that'll allow it to carve the most effectively. I purchased pretty much all my parts from McMaster.com, although really you could get these anywhere you want. There are three aluminum box tubes that were used to make the frame. Two of these were a 6063 series aluminum and the one was a 6061 series aluminum. All of the cuts for the frame parts were made with my seven and a quarter inch miter saw. I used a carbide tipped blade to make these cuts in the aluminum, which was a lot easier than using something like a hacksaw, which I've done before in the past. The first part I cut was a central box tube. This was cut to 35 inches long and two 27 degree bevels were put on the other end of the box. Next, I cut the four one by one inch crossbars. The front and rear crossbar were cut a little bit shorter in length than the middle two, which go out through the ski supports. By far, the trickiest parts to cut are the four ski supports, which slope down from the middle crossbars at a 30 degree angle. There are four cuts required on these supports, and the first is made at a 40 degree angle to the bottom end of the support. The second cut is at 30 degrees and forms the edge which will lie flush with the top of the crossbar. The third cut is the trickiest as it's made at a 15 degree angle with respect to the lengthwise direction of the box tube. I did not cut completely through the box tube as I did not want the tube to collapse on itself and bind in the saw. So what I did is I cut almost the whole way through, pulled the parts apart, and twisted them until they broke apart. The four ski pivots were cut from the four inch by one and three quarter inch box tube. And these were made by making a bunch of cuts on the sides of the box tubes. The front ski pivots are a little trickier because the front of those is taller than the back. So you had to cut each side of the box tube independently. With all the pieces cut, I moved on to finishing each individual one. The central box tube came first. And the first thing there was to cut a slot for the handlebar using a hacksaw and a cutoff wheel on the Dremel tool. 
there is four square holes that run through the sides of this box tube for the crossbars. These holes were created by first drilling holes in the corner of each square. These holes were large enough to allow a jigsaw blade to go into them so that I could jigsaw out the rough shape of the square holes. I want each crossbar to slide through these holes smoothly and easily without having excessive play uh, while being square with the central box tube. I also drilled holes to attach the crossbars to the central box tube as well as a crosslink slot. The crosslink is the part of the steering that runs across and connects the two tie rods to the inner link which connects the handlebar. The ski supports are connected to the two central crossbars and the crossbars sit flush with the top of the ski support which meant I had to cut a notch out of each ski support. I did this using first the hacksaw and then finishing it with the cutoff wheel and the dremel tool. At this point I also drilled some holes for mounting to the crossbar as well as the ski pivot hole in the bottom of each ski support. The next parts to finish were the crossbars. The crossbars needed to be lined up with the edges of the ski supports and then those holes that I had previously drilled in the ski supports were continued through each crossbar. These holes are slightly undersized because I wanted to tap the thread connections between the ski supports and the crossbars. The reason for this was that given the angle of the ski supports relative to the crossbar, there's a torque introduced on those connections and I wanted everything to be extremely tight and really the only way to do that was to use a tapped hole. There was also a slot cut into the forward crossbar. This slot is for the inner link of the steering system to pass through. With the ski supports and crossbars finished, I bolted one ski support to each crossbar with the other end left open so I could slide it through the central box tube. Pilot holes for the pivot bolts were drilled in all four ski pivots. This was eventually enlarged to the 5 and 16 inch size required by the pivot bolt. On the forward ski pivots, I also drilled holes high up in the front of the pivot. This hole was made square to fit a carriage bolt that was used to attach the tie rod ends. With the frame components finished, the frame was assembled. The first step was to drill the crossbar mounting holes in the crossbars. Each crossbar was individually slid into its respective hole in the central box before it was carefully centered on the sled and squared up using a square. From that point, I continued the holes that were already in the central box tube through those crossbars and tapped the holes. With the crossbars through the central box tube, I could attach those secondary ski supports to the center two crossbars. Everything was assembled with stainless steel bolts and nuts, which allows everything to remain rust-free over years of use. With the frame ready, I decided to put it on the floor and jump on it just to make sure everything held together, which it passed with flying colors. The two steering links were created from stainless steel for its properties of being very hard and resilient to rust. On the rear end of the inner link, a pin was cut which protrudes into the cross link. This pin was first cut with a hacksaw and then it was finished with the file. On the other end of the inner link is a short slot that is used to connect the inner link to the handlebar. On the cross link side, there's a hole on each end for connecting to the tie rod. And then there is a rectangular hole in the middle into which the pin of the inner link sits. I may not have a favorite food or animal, but I have a favorite metal and that's titanium. Over the years, I've occasionally made jewelry from titanium and I quickly learned that it's extremely hard. So hard that only carbide and diamond tools can machine it. For the sled, I was concerned about where between the cross link and the aluminum central box tube at the point where it slides. Since the tie rods attached to the cross link at an angle, there is a force exerted on the upper and lower edges of the sliding interface as the skis are tipped left and right. In order to prevent wear of the central box tube, I decided to bolt small titanium glide plates to the central box tube. I made these one by one inch glide plates from a 16th inch thick piece of titanium. The bolt and slot holes were drilled using some carbide drill bits that I found at Harbor Freight. These bits have a 1 8 inch shank which fits into a Dremel tool and I found them to work the best in titanium of any bit I've ever used. 
Once the slot was roughed out, I once again finished that up with a carbide cutter in the Dremel tool and my small needle files, which surprisingly work okay in titanium. Two 1 inch aluminum plates are mounted to the top and bottom of the handlebar to both reinforce the pivot point and provide a connection point for the inner steering link. Given the large number of angles on these plates, multiple cuts at different angles were required to arrive at the finished shape. Each plate is attached to the handlebar by two bolts which pass through quarter inch holes at each end of the plate. A three quarter inch hole in the center of each plate is for the half inch handlebar pivot bolt and a concentric nylon spacing washer. Finally, two holes for attachment of the inner link were drilled into the end of the plate tabs. With the handlebar being 7 16 inch thick and the inner link 3 16 inch, both of the plate tabs were bent together using a vice grip sheet metal tool. The handlebar and decking were made from a single one inch rough cut walnut board. A 22 inch length of board was cut off and planed to use for the handlebar. I continued to plane this board until it easily slid into the central box tube handlebar slot when it was sandwiched between the two aluminum handlebar plates. I cut the handlebar to shape using my jigsaw and then smoothed out the gripping edges using a quarter inch round over bit in my router. Holes for attachment of the handlebar plates were made by first clamping the handlebar plates on both sides of the handlebar and then drilling the quarter inch holes from both sides so that they would meet in the middle. This made sure that the holes aligned the entire way through the board to the opposite hole. Drilling of the handlebar pivot hole was done in three steps. The first step was to drill an eighth inch pilot hole the entire way through the handlebar to mark the position of the hole. Next, a three quarter inch Forstner bit was used to create a slight recess on both sides of the handlebar. These recesses are for the nylon spacer which will fit around the pivot bolt. Finally, the half inch pivot bolt hole was drilled the entire way through the handlebar. The decking was made from the same walnut board as the handlebar. This board was slightly planed before a square was ripped off the one edge to serve as the two rails on both sides of the deck. All of the edges of these deck rails were rounded using the same router roundover bit that I used on the handlebar. Next, a three and three quarter inch wide board was cut to serve as the deck boards. Since the deck boards are around a quarter inch thick, they can be made by ripping the three and three quarter wide board in half vertically. To make this cut, the table saw fence was moved such that the blade would perfectly bisect the board when in a vertical orientation. After ripping the board halfway through, I flipped the board and the other half was ripped separating it in two halves. This is a dangerous cut for several reasons. For one, the blade is entirely embedded inside the wood, which increases the chances of a kickback. Second, the narrowness of the board necessitates that my hand gets a little bit closer to the blade. When I was not comfortable with that, I used a pusher block to push the board. I finished all of the wood with Danish oil. I like the Danish oil because it's easy to apply and I can also reapply it if moisture messes up the wood over time. To attach the decking to the frame, the decking was first laid out on the frame and aligned and then the position of the holes in the frame were transferred to the boards using a drill bit. With this position marked, I could finish the holes through the wood. All of the decking and rails was attached to the frame using quarter inch bolts, nuts, and lock washers. I used a pair of 135 centimeter skis that I found on Craigslist for $10. Before attaching the skis to the ski pivots, the pivots were attached to the ski supports using one and three quarter inch long, five sixteenth inch shoulder screws. Washers were placed between the pivots and ski supports to take up any slack between these components. With the pivots attached to the frame, the frame was aligned over the skis, and then the hole positions in the skis were marked using a drill bit. These holes were finished in the drill press with the depth stop adjusted so that I did not go down through the base of the skis. With all the holes drilled, I used some ski binding screws to attach the skis to the pivots. 
The last step of the build was to assemble the steering. First, the crosslink was inserted into the titanium guide plates through the central box tube. The inner link was secured to the handlebar using a quarter inch shoulder screw. This handlebar inner link assembly was then slid into the central box tube. The handlebar was secured to the central box using a half inch shoulder screw. The inner link pivot bolt was also reinstalled through the inner link pivot and the front crossbar. Finally, the tie rods were attached between the front ski pivots and the cross link. And that's how I ended up building the Mark II ski sled. You'll want to stick around for the next video as I end up testing this on a no winter maintenance road. If you are interested in building something like this for yourself, I would recommend going to my website at nicolagrage.com and I will have full instructions there on how I did this as well as some detailed plans. You can also go to theskisled.com. Well, I'm Josh, this is Nicola Garage, and I think this is it for today. I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>